Today's message is entitled Authentic Worship. Authentic Worship. And I'm going to... I'm going to pray. Father, teach us about authentic worship. Purify our hearts. We know, Father, you're seeking those who worship you in spirit and truth. And we want to be those who worship you in spirit and in truth. And not just with singing, Lord, but with our whole lives laid down on the altar. Give me grace to share and just prepare our hearts to receive the seeds of your word that they would bear much fruit for your glory. We give you the praise, honor, and the worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's put our hands on our hearts and if we can pray this with conviction. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart and change my life. In your precious name. Amen. So authentic worship. Let's look at this subject. Let's get into this subject here. And afterwards at the end I want to read a report from Daniel and Diane. They're on the road and they're doing well. Some challenges often but they're doing well so we're, we're grateful for that. So let me read to you the opening scripture from the NIV version here, Romans 12, 1 and 2. After that, I'll read it from my uh, translation that I've been working on this week of the same verses. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen? I will also read this in the translation I've been working on. I've set it out in a poetic form. You can also go to brisbanefire.com, go to the Inspiration Fire online store and download it. You can get a high quality version. You could even, Anna even puts it up on her phone sometimes as a screensaver. Some of these things, you can have it on your phone as a photo, look at it, uh, meditate on it during the week, um, read it while you're standing in line. That's the purpose why I make these things so that they can be uh, you can use them and they can be useful to you. So this one, Authentic Worship, it's entitled Romans 12, 1 and 2. So I urge you, family, because of God's compassion, surrender your whole lives as a living sacrifice, an offering set apart and enjoyable to God. That's authentic worship. Don't be shaped by this age but be metamorphosized by your mind's renewal, enabling you to test like gold in the fire what is genuinely God's desire, His good, enjoyable, and complete will. So that's my translation of it. This week, just done this week. I Now I'll zoom in, I'll read it one more time because we really want the word to wash over us. And then I'll talk about it some more. So I urge you, family, because of God's compassion, surrender your whole lives as a living sacrifice, an offering set apart and enjoyable to God. That's authentic worship. Don't be shaped by this age, but be metamorphosized by your mind's renewal, enabling you to test like gold in the fire what is genuinely God's desire, His good, enjoyable, and complete will. So that's Romans 12. One through two. This is my backyard cafe. You know, I, I say backyard cafe, it's a joke. The, the cafe part is a joke. All it is is a table and a couple of chairs. And you know I talked about a, a number a couple of years ago where I said I'm in 
I'm in my backyard. My cafe and the kids were messing up the area. I said, don't mess it up. You know, I may lose customers. And he said, he has no customers. <laughs> to, to the other, <laughs> other kids in the family, I just want you to know he has no customers. <laughs> <laughs> It's just me in the backyard, and Anna bought me this, what is it called, the desert rose? Uh, desert rose bonsai tree. I love bonsai trees, you know, I love bonsai trees. And this is this desert rose bonsai style tree. It's on the table there. Well, it was about a year ago, I was praying in my backyard cafe. I brought the cost of what he has called us to do before the Lord. So I was bringing this before the Lord. And all the cost of all of this, it's so costly. And I was looking for some escape from the weight of it, from what he's called us to do from the ministry. I was looking for some type of escape from the weight of it. And then God's word came to me clearly, putting me into the proper perspective. This is why we need to hear God, listen to his voice, because it does put us into the right light and does put us into that proper perspective. And he said, I desire a costly sacrifice. So the Lord said to me, I desire a costly sacrifice. And while it was uncomfortable for me, I realized that this is what the Lord's will is. And we'll see this in 2 Samuel 24, 24. So we'll go over there to 2 Samuel 24, 24. Um, no, I'm not talking about the referendum today. <laughs> I was trying to say that in a text message, but may not have come out clearly. Uh, I do know, though, we need to pray for peace for our nation, peace for Israel, uh, salvation for both the Jews and the Palestinians, salvation for every people group. God loves every people group. And uh, so that's... That's very important for us to be in intercession for. Now, 2 Samuel 24, 24, David was going to be given something free to offer to God. But the king replied to Aruna, No, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord, my God, burnt offerings that cost me nothing. Did you see that? No, I insist on paying for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. The weight lifted off me when I embraced the cost, surrendering to God's will. I also realized I wasn't doing God's will alone. Jesus was carrying my cross with me. And God's way is the way of the cross. There's no way around that, though many people try to take paths around the cross. There's no way around the cross, uh, the cross if you're going to do things authentically in God's eyes. God's way is the way of the cross. But this age focuses on saving yourself from your cross. So if you went to some type of counseling, they'd be trying to seek some ways to try to take that cross from you. I've also had times where I explained some of the trials and tribulations to other uh, believers, leaders, and uh, some, some that know God's heart and mind would encourage me. Other people would just say, hey, why don't you stop that and choose a new career or do this or that. I've been given that advice a lot. And this is why we, we hear, in, in life we hear many voices. You know what's the most important voice? God's voice. What he says and being obedient to that voice. We need to know that voice in scripture, God speaking to us, and also personally. And whatever God speaks to us personally will align with his Scripture with his word. So it's a way of testing him. So God's way is the way of the cross, but this age focuses on saving yourself from the cross. Now look at the spirit of this age in Matthew 27, 38. Matthew chapter 27, verse 38.
Here's Jesus on the cross. Two rebels, two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Notice what, it's, what they're saying to Jesus. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He, can, he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the, he, can't, he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Now, in our opening scripture, we, were, we read from Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that we are not to be conformed to the spirit of this age. The age is sending messages, save yourself, come down from the cross, uh, and do something, do something good for yourself, so to speak. And while God is good and He's given this life, He's given us life to enjoy it, we also, if we are going to do God's will, need to carry our cross and surrender the, to the cross. And all that means. In Romans 12, 1 through 2, Paul uses imagery, imagery from the tabernacle and temple to call people to become the sacrifices they traditionally offered to God. So in this, in these two verses that we opened up with, Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul uses imagery. And that's imagery taken from the tabernacle, taken from the temple. And he calls people to become the sacrifices that they traditionally offered on the altar in the tabernacle. In other words, he is saying, not merely offering up animals, but offering yourselves on the altar. I want you to become like those animals that were sacrificed. Lay yourself on the altar, surrender to God in this way. Paul has just spent 11 chapters in Romans giving us a panoramic view of God's grace. And now he urges us to respond. The only logical thing to do is offer our whole lives to God, just like our Lord and Savior offered his body on the cross. Paul's call is that we become one with the cross. That's authentic worship and true transformation. It's much more than just our time in church singing, which is very important. But it's much more than just singing. Worship is the laying down of our lives on God's altar, the surrender to His will and His purpose, the giving of ourselves to say, Lord, I'm wholly yours. I'm giving my whole self to you. I'm holding nothing back. And that, that's uh, authentic worship, and that's where true transformation happens. The temptation has always been to want the benefits of the cross, like forgiveness and mercy. The temptation has always been to want the benefits of the cross without going on the altar of the cross. Being bound to the altar is Jesus' way. But at this point, many will turn to the bargain store for a discounted religion. God desires a costly offering. It costs your whole life. There's no negotiating the sacrifice. Okay, God, you know, uh, how, about, uh, how about 50%, 50%? No, not 50, how about 60? Why don't we do 60, 60%? No, no, okay. Phil, what, 55? No, 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 no. Higher, higher, higher. <laughs> 80? 
Ninety? No, a hundred percent. There's no negotiating the sacrifice. Steve Hill from the revival in Pensacola, which went from approximately 1995 to 2001, Steve Hill often said, while we were there, religion is hanging around the cross. Christianity is getting on the cross. Did you hear that? You'd almost say this every night. Religion is hanging around the cross. Christianity is getting on the cross. That's Steve. He's now with the Lord. Uh, he didn't live a long life, but a very fruitful one. In Leviticus chapter 1, we discover the way of the offering. And if you can turn there, uh, we'll be reading from there uh, soon. In Leviticus 1, we, di we discover the way of the offering. Often people get bogged down and fall asleep when reading Leviticus. Now, I was talking about this at, at Bible school. Sometimes, you, you know, we determine that at the beginning of the year, oh, I'm going to read the Bible in a year. I'm going to read the Bible in a year. And we, 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 we're good in Genesis, Exodus. Then when it, once it comes to Leviticus, people give up. And they get bogged down in Leviticus. And the reason is that we don't see Leviticus with the eyes of revelation or with the eyes of God. Like we're reading in our own strength. We're reading without the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to read the scripture with the power of the Holy Spirit, relying on him, especially for the mysteries that we encounter. For those who have eyes to see revelation, which we learned in Bible school, apocalypsis, apocalypsis, revelation, uh, if you read with Revelation, Moses paints a picture of our Messiah, Jesus. So for those who have eyes to see, Moses paints a picture of our Messiah, Jesus. Leviticus 1 also gives us insight into how we can follow in Christ's steps and lay our lives on the altar. If you have your, keep your finger in Leviticus 1. I'll show you this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, if you're not convinced. <laughs> now, just to encourage you in this area, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Notice how, how it says there, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So Leviticus 1 gives us insight into how we can follow in Christ's steps and lay our lives on the altar. It also shows us the way of being God's friends. This is the way of God's friends. You know that in scripture it calls Abraham a friend of God. And this specifically relates to him laying down his son Isaac, his all on the altar. And then we have this again, this theme again repeated by Jesus in John 15. And we know that John 15 starts with I am the vine and you are the branches or I am the true vine. And then verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. And then we come down to verse 13. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. And this command is for us to lay our life down as worship on the altar. Not to bargain with God, not to try to get some go a cheap way but to, to lay everything down for him and this reminds me I'm, I was talking about the revival before we had a time in, in the, the revival in Pensacola and I'm just remembering this I wasn't planning to share it. we had a time where there was a call to give everything on the altar to surrender our lives on the altar and this is before I knew Anna and 
I responded to that call and I got down on my face before God. A lot of us were down on our face before God. But there were some people that were uh, not on their face. They might have been sitting, maybe offering themselves to God, but they have been sitting. And many people testified to a visible cloud that came into the room. It was thick and it was hard to see your own hand in front of your uh, eyes. And then the ones that didn't see it were the ones that were on their face. <laughs> but there was, if that was the testimony of so many people, and there was how many people? I think there's about a thousand people in the room. And um, one of the things that was clear is there was a great sense of God's presence there, a very thick sense of God's presence. And it was in response to us laying our whole lives before the altar. And so what was I doing back then? How old was I? Was I like 21 or 22? I forget exactly, but here I was laying my future down, laying down saying, God, whoever you want me to marry, or if you don't want me to marry, wherever you want me to go, Lord, whatever you want me to do, Lord, whatever it is, I'm putting it on the altar. And I did that and then I know shortly after that I met Anna, <laughs> and, but it was after I had put everything on the altar there. Now, verse 13, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And so God is our friend, we lay our life down for him and also we lay our lives down for one another. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Now, I may talk about being a friend of God in the future, so I won't uh, develop that right now. But just to give us a little taste of that. Now, going back to Leviticus chapter 1, let's read this. Because it's teaching us how we can lay our lives down. Now it's first, we give ourselves first to God and then to one another. It's not first to one another and then to God. It's first to God as a living sacrifice and a pleasing, pleasing fragrant aroma to Him. And then it's to, uh, and, and that is a blessing to one another. Then it's to one another, but it's always first to God. So here in Leviticus chapter 1, the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him for the tent of meeting. He said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when anyone among you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, and this is the offering that Paul is referring to in Romans chapter 12. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you are to offer a male without defect. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. You are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. You are to slaughter the young bull before the Lord and then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall bring the blood and splash it against the sides of the altar at the entrance to the tent of meeting. You are to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, are to put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Then Aaron's sons, the priest, shall arrange the pieces, including the head and the fat, on the wood that is burning on the altar. You are to wash the internal organs and the legs with water, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. And then it describes this if it's coming from a flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the flock, from either the sheep or the goats, you are to offer a male without defect. And it says very much the same thing. And at the end it says it is a burnt offering, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. So let's talk about this some more and I won't 
go through all the details of this passage. I didn't want to overwhelm you this morning. I may, God willing, share on the details in the future. But the one thing that I want to focus on is this phrase, male without defect. You are to offer a male without defect. Leviticus 1.3, also you find it in Leviticus 1.10. A male without defect. Now it's a very interesting word in Hebrew, tamim. Tamim. Tamim means something that is whole and complete and intact. It also comes up in Psalm 119, verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled who walk in the way, uh, uh, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are the undefiled who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep your testimonies, who seek you with all your, all, who seek Him with all their heart. Now, the undefiled part, blessed are the undefiled, that's tamim. And tamim is something that is, ta, ta, tamim is something that is uh, whole, complete, without defect. So a male without defect. Jesus is the fulfillment of the male without defect. He was innocent, sinless, Complete, undefiled, and intact. You'll see this in Hebrews 9.14. Do I hear an amen? amen. Mm -hmm. He is that. He is the fulfillment of this. And so in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. We read. How much more then will the blood of Christ. Who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God. He offered himself unblemished to God. Cleanse your consciences from acts that lead to death. So that we may serve the living God. So this is, Leviticus 1 is giving us a picture of Jesus in, this, in the sacrifices. And in the way of the sacrifices. Now observe that the sacrifice couldn't be cheap, defective, or lacking cost. The Israelites were commanded to give their best because God was the highest king. So because God was the highest king, they were supposed to give their best on the altar, but also because this was prophesying Jesus. Every time they were sacrificing, they were prophesying Jesus, who he was. And that he was without defect. He was unblemished. He was tamim. So if you go to Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 1. If you don't turn there, I'll, I'll read it to you. But God has a controversy with Israel. He's, he's upset with them about an issue here. Now, uh, kids ask, does God ever get angry? And I, I guess it's popular in Christianity to say, well, God doesn't get angry. He's love. But realize that God does get angry, but he still loves. That's the proper theology. God gets angry. There's things that he does not like because he, that's because he's good. I mean, a good person doesn't like bad things happen to other people. Uh, because he's good, he does get angry. There's such a thing as righteous anger and wrath. which was so important to the good news, so important to the gospel, but we've kind of cut it out. The thing is, we need to tell the whole story, and that is, yeah, God is upset, right? Let me say it like this. God is angry, God is upset, but he still loves you. And while you are still a sinner, he died for you, and he still cares about you, and he still wants to wash you and cleanse you and restore you. His anger is not like human anger, which rejects you. Also, I said that God is to Valerie, she was asking this question. We have good conversations in the car. I said, uh, also God has said, I am not easily angered. So God doesn't easily get angered. He doesn't uh, fly off the handle. He's slow to anger. The picture is that a long nose in the Hebrew, literally a long nose. Oh, <laughs> he looks at us and then takes a very deep breath. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, Glenn. Okay. 
uh, as I'm complaining there in my backyard ca cafe. <laughs> Haven't you preached this a thousand times, Glenn? I desire a costly offering. <laughs> so, notice here, Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. A son honors his father, and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty. It is you, priest, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible when you offer blind animals. Look at that. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now plead with God to be gracious to us with such offerings from your hands. Will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now, here then he says, my name will be honored as great. In verse 11, my name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. So this all has to do about, this all has to do with his name. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. We see God's grace in all of this because even though they're doing the wrong thing, God is graciously correcting them. He's not giving up on them. He's, he's striving with them. He's persuading them that, hey, this way is not the right way. So... We see this in Leviticus chapter 1 as the laws of the sacrifice are being introduced to us that the sacrifice couldn't be cheap, defective, or lacking cost. And we know the reason for that is it's meant to glorify the name of God and he is the king above every other king. Just like if the queen came here, now we got to say the king, right? I remember when the queen came here, we were, all lined up, we were all lined up at South Bank to watch the queen coming from a distance. I was one of those. And, and though, though American, I'm an Australian citizen now, but though, you know, born in America, I was excited to see the queen. Oh, the queen, the queen. You saw her like a little dot. You know, that's, <laughs> there she is on that, on that uh, city cat type of thing. It was, it was some city cat type of, uh, what do you call it, cataran? Or, and it was coming in. Oh, she's on there. I don't, you know. I don't even know if we even saw her. We just knew she was on the, the ship. And everybody was at the whole place, the whole bridge, everything was jam-packed with people. Well, the queen doesn't come and you don't serve her. If the queen comes, sorry, if the queen comes, you don't serve her paper plates, right? Paper plates and paper cups and plastic. Uh, I, I'm sure she is so gracious that she would, she would eat it like this right of course now it's the king you know it's the king it's the king so we got to change our illustration right the king but i'm thinking of the queen right now but you don't do that and god is saying the same way you honor him you bring the best to him and that was fulfilled in jesus giving us all undefiled sinless unblemished and that's why his blood speaks a louder word than the blood of abel They couldn't say, hey, let's get rid of that one. It's no good to us. Hey, look at that sheep there. It's, got, it's blind. It's limping. It's no good to us. Let's give it to God. Right? And this is how people think today. It's so ingrained in our thinking. Like when I came in here, was, when I came to Australia, it was, let's save the used tea bags for the missionaries. And so you use the tea bag, but don't throw it out. You put it on the side, and we send those used used tea bags to the missionaries. I was like, oh, that's a bit of a strange way of thinking. Why don't we just buy, tea is not even that expensive. Why don't we just buy a new box and send it to the missionaries? But it's all this kind of way of thinking which is deeply ingrained in us and it's always been ingrained in humans. We're trying to look for a bargain. Right? It's like, 
again, you know, that's twenty dollars. Can I get it for fifteen? And that's o that's okay for the uh, flea market, for the uh, market since you go to. That's okay for the markets you go to, but it's not okay with God. Hey, let's get rid of this one. It's no good to us. In other words, they couldn't give God their pocket change. God does not want our donations for the opportunity shop. He wants our all. He wants our best. Hey, I don't like this anymore. Let me give it to the op shop as a donation. You can do those things, but that is not your offering to God. Those are just nice things that people do. We're just looking to clear, clean the house. I uh, don't think you're doing anything great for God if you're doing that. <laughs> um, you're helping, helping out, and yes, please help out, but this is not what God is calling for is our whole lives and our offerings to be, uh, our offerings to be something that are, is substantial and that are a sacrifice. Look at this innocent lamb here. We're coming to a close soon. A male without defect, Tamim. Let's reflect on this some more. There are no bargaining discounts with God. I, this is repeating myself. He, we can't negotiate our terms. He calls for all. He calls for all. Sacrifice is love motivated. Sacrifice is love motivated. It's not suicide, self-harm, or religious busyness. So when it, comes to, when it comes to sacrifice, sometimes people think, oh, you're, it's like suicide, or you're harming yourself, or you're just really, really busy religiously doing all this activity, and if I do that, I'm sacrificing. But that's not the sacrifice that God is calling for. He's calling for a love motivated sacrifice. Remember, in view of God's mercy, or how I like to translate it, it's more literal, in view of God's compassion. Look at all of his compassion. Look at all of his grace. And in view of that, respond out of love, offering yourself on the altar. But there's also that warning in Scripture, to obey is better than sacrifice. So there is sacrifices that are just religious and our own thing rather than God's. But the thing is, when we're obedient to his voice, it will always lead us to true, authentic sacrifice. The sacrifice had to be whole, meaning it was well cared for by the shepherd. Now, this is my last major point. The sacrifice had to be whole, tamim meaning it was well cared for by the shepherd. If we are going to be living sacrifices that God enjoys, that he takes pleasure in, we need to let him care, nourish, and protect us. And this is the thing that I found with people have taught about sacrifice or denying yourself. Often it meant for them neglecting yourself. But if they neglected a sheep, if it was not well cared for and fed and nourished, they could not offer that sheep on the altar. It had to be cared for, nourished, valued. And in the same way, God doesn't want you like mangled looking on the altar. <laughs> he wants to care for you, nourish you, look after you. And this also is... A biblical, we need to see this biblical self-care and that we're allowing the Holy Spirit to care for us. So it does not mean neglecting your well-being. Your well-being is very important to God. Uh, so again, we often think, oh, sacrifice means, oh, I, I'm to neglect my well-being. No, you need to allow God to care for your well-being. And then as he cares for your well-being, then you can truly offer yourself as a living sacrifice. The two things go together. A male without defect. A, a male that was 
tamim, whole. We care for ourselves with the Holy Spirit's power. We care for ourselves with the Holy Spirit's power. Jesus offered himself to God unblemished. How? By the eternal spirit. So he was doing it by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was empowering him. And so that way he could do it with joy. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And religion takes the joy out of it. <laughs> religion takes the well-being of our souls out of it. And just want, uh, in, in different cults, they may preach, oh, sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. For, they, for them, it means they're trying to put you in a state of a lot of fasting and also a lot of uh, uh, sleep denial so that they can control you. But this is not what God is talking about. God wants us to be intimate with Him. And so we are being renewed. And if, any fa if we do fasting, if we do staying, watching, and praying, it is out of love and not out of somebody trying to manipulate or control us and not because we're trying to uh, you know, twist God's arm. There is a different way, a different approach. That is, yeah, it's a spirit-empowered approach that we all need to learn and live in. So the sacrifice had to be whole, meaning it was well cared for by the shepherd. And if we are going to be living sacrifices that God enjoys, we need to let him nourish and protect us. Often there's a choice before us. Oh, do I spend some time with the Lord or do I do all this busy work that I need to do? And, oh, and then we might think, oh, deny myself so I won't spend some time with the Lord. I'll do all this busy work. Now that's the wrong decision. The right decision is spend time with God, get the strength you need, and then He also will give you the wisdom about the things that are really important and essential and the things that can be uh, put aside for a moment. So God is concerned about our well-being. And I bring this up because it's easy to get confused in this matter. Look at what Ephesians 5, 29 through 30 says in the NASB version. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. So I'll say that again. This is how Christ treats us. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Just as Christ also does for the church, because we are members of his body. Another thing I want to bring up here is I, often we feel guilty for resting. Have you ever felt guilty if you're resting or relaxing, you felt guilty for it? But you need to rest. God even commands rest. And now we have freedom. It's not bound to just one day. We have freedom in that rhythm of rest. But you need to rest. And you need to relax. And you need to have time where you're not thinking about paying the bills and all the stressful things. And I would encourage you to invite God into your rest time. But you do need rest. You do need that time and that uh, we, we are not meant to sacrifice our time with the Lord. Our time with the Lord is where we come before him and say, Lord, I'm giving everything to you and I, I need you and I'm offering everything to you, Lord. This brings us to our last slide here and to the verse verses that we opened up with and I hope that we'll each have more illumination on it and I'll read this to you again Romans 12 1 through 2 and I may comment on a few places so I urge you family because of God's compassion surrender your whole lives as a living sacrifice an offering set apart and enjoyable to God that's authentic worship don't be shaped by this age, 
but be metamorphosized. That's a very literal rendering of the Greek word, be metamorphosized. And I think most people would know what that means. A metamorphosis, a change, a transformation, like the butterfly, the caterpillar to the butterfly, but be metamorphosized by your mind's renewal, enabling you to test like gold in the fire what is genuinely God's desire, his good, enjoyable, and complete will. Now, as you often, again, another mistake we make is that when it comes to prayer, we're praying, God, what is your will? Do this or do that. And we make God out into like a, kind of like a, one of these eight balls. Do you want yes or no? And you know those eight balls, you kind of shake it. It's yes or no, God, what do you want me to do? You want me to do this deal or that deal? You want me to go to this place, that place? You know what? God is not so much concerned about all of that stuff that we are concerned about. What his will is, is that we would lay our lives on his altar. Give it all to him. Surrender all to him. And when you do that, then you are able to know almost instinctively what he wants you to do. But let's not make God out to be our fortune teller or our eight ball. Uh, or he's not, he's not our clown clairvoyant. He actually tells us to stay away from mediums and spiritists because it gives us a wrong view of God. God is all about intimacy and relationship and friendship. He wants that friendship with us. If we had that friendship with us, if, if we had that friendship with him, even if we go make the wrong choice, then he says, okay, no, no, that wasn't right. He just guides you back. It's not so much of a big deal when you're in friendship with God. But it is a big deal if you had a friendship with God because then you can get destroyed by these choices that you make. So the main thing is God's will is surrender to Him. And then you're able to, after that, practicing that, then you're able to test what is His genuine desire. And His will is good, enjoyable, and complete. In interpretation, some people say, oh, there's uh, three different types of w God's will. His good will, his pleasing will, and his perfect will. You may have heard teaching about it. Well, his good will is this, his perfect will. I mean, his good will is this, his uh, pleasing will is this, and his perfect will is this. You may have heard teaching on that, but th I don't see that in what the Scripture is trying to say. It's just describing what God's will is. His, his will is good. His will is enjoyable. Hey, when you do it God's will, it's actually enjoyable. Hallelujah. Yeah. I, I, when I, I told you uh, at Bible school, when I'm teaching at Bible school or when I'm preaching, I enjoy it. I don't enjoy some of the other things that come along with uh, ministry, but I enjoy doing God's will. It's enjoyable. It's good. And God's will is complete. There's nothing lacking in it. Amen? So I'm going to pray. And then Daniel and Diana are doing God's will right now as they go out. I was really concerned about them going out and, uh, with their health. But I didn't want to discourage them and say, no, don't go out. Because I know how much in weakness God transforms it into our strength and power. And I was thinking with Daniel and Diane, this is a long trip going into the snowy mountains when they've already been struggling physically. And the thing is, the physical prob problems will probably be there if you're at home or you're out. At home, you can control it a bit more, but they were going in faith and they were doing this in response to what God wanted. And so I didn't want to say, hey, you know, uh, even though I was a little bit concerned, and don't go, I wanted not to interfere and it's turning out to be a really awesome trip though there is some hardship here you know some challenges and hardship but they are enjoying doing i see a smile on their face better than being cooped up at home and complaining about I, <laughs> my shoulder's not moving uh, yes they are living example of that verse so let me read this to you, but they do need our prayer. I want to say they do need our prayer and our covering. So here's what Daniel and Diane say. 
Good morning, church. We love you and miss fellowshipping with you today. But our prayers are for you that heaven will touch earth and God will unfold his awesome love and grace on all of you and for those on Zoom and Facebook. God had been awesome on our trip despite great physical hardship and harassment from the enemy. So far, we have given away over 175 things, including 131 Bibles, and we haven't hit the snowy mountains yet. People have been surprised and touched by his amazing presence and love. In Port Macquarie, we, we, were, we, we were received so warmly, and there was hunger in amongst the grassroots people we met. Even in the small town of McLean, God touched someone. We felt to give this lady a surfer prophetic painting and she shared she, she's a surfer and goes all around Australia catching the big waves. And in Heatherbrae, we were able to share the gospel with a Chinese international and even give him a Bible. God loves his sparrows. Please pray for us as Dai is in pain constantly and sleep is very hard to come by with terrible hard beds. We hope to meet with more people today and we, we travel to Puma tomorrow. Love you lots, stand and die. So with that, we'll pray. Amen. Father, first, we want to come and give you ourselves and lay, lay ourselves on your altar and give you all. We want to surrender to your will and say, God, may we be those who lay down everything for your glory. We offer our whole lives in surrender to you. Cause us by your Holy Spirit to offer ourselves to you. And let us understand the that balance between our well-being and sacrifice. And that your will is good, it's enjoyable, and it's not lacking anything. Every time we sing, may we be laying ourselves on the altar. Every day we wake up, may we lay ourselves on the altar. Even despite our, our problems and our, and our pain, we thank you that you turn our weakness into strength. And that through Jesus, we can offer ourselves unblemished to you. Through Jesus in Christ, we can offer ourselves whole to you. Even though we fall short of the glory of God, it is through your blood. And we pray for Daniel and Diane. We pray for miraculous healing and power and grace on them. Empower Daniel and Diane. And refresh them. Refresh their bodies. Help them. Send your ministering angels to them. And open up doors for the sake of your gospel. That people would encounter you on the road. These sparrows would encounter you on the road. And these Bibles, you would use these Bibles to bring salvation to people to open up their eyes to see you. Just move through them and their trip. Keep them safe on the road. And I pray for a great harvest through their work that their sacrifice would be rewarded. We know that they're responding to your call. And we're asking that the grace, the abundant grace of your spirit would be there for them shielding them, protecting them. Thank you, Father. <laughs> I thank you for the attitude uh, of Daniel and Diane that even the, if the devil is going to beat us up, well, we're going to beat him up some more. <laughs> we're not going to let him manipulate us or control us. We're going to be overcomers. So bless them and Reveal, let heaven touch earth as we end in worship. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen? Okay, if we can, I want us to stand and worship. Is that okay? And just as, as we worship one, one song, just offer up ourselves. Offer up ourselves to the Lord here. I'm going to... Mm-hmm. 